God, and that's what we're doing. Would you uh, turn, please, in the Scripture to uh, 2 Timothy 3 and Psalm 4. 2 Timothy 3 and Psalm 4. Now, if you're visiting with us tonight, let me just give you a heads up. We don't have an hour and a half service. <laughs> it goes longer than that. But when, when will it be over? Well, when it's over. How long does it take? Well, I don't, sometimes it takes longer than other times. If you get all you want and you say, I've had enough, well, you can leave. That's all right. Just be happy, smile, and come back when you want some more. But uh, we don't just come to check the box and say we went to church. We come to bring the Lord something. Bring worship, bring praise, bring our offerings, right? And we also come to receive something from Him. And we believe He's here. We believe He speaks directly to us through His Word and by His Spirit. And He's here to answer our questions and give us direction and show us what to do and what's coming next and what to do. And you will be tested on this material. <laughs> no, not a written test at the end of the service, but in life, you will. And so you want to pay attention. And instead of focusing on how quick you can get out, you want to make sure you understand it. Can I do it? Can I put it into practice? And then you're ready. Let's pray and believe God. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. How good you are. We bless you. We praise you forever. We honor your word. We honor your spirit. We say, teach us exactly what we should hear and see and do tonight. Give us understanding. Give us eyes open, ears open, heart open to receive. Revelation of truth that makes free. Answer questions and show solutions and direction and, and the next part of the plan and the next steps to take. We purpose not to be hearers only, but by your grace we will be doers. And we know as we do, we'll be blessed. You're so faithful to watch over your word and perform it in our lives when we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. 2 Timothy 3, Psalm 4. Are you there? You believing with me? Yes. Please do. 2 Timothy the third, excuse me, what did I say? Yeah, that's right. Third chapter, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous times. In the last days. We are in the latest days there have ever been. Nobody has ever lived any later than us. That's for sure. And he said in the last days, did he say it would get safer? No, what did he say? Perilous. What does peril mean? Dangerous. Perilous, dangerous times would come. And, uh, you know, you can, we've kind of gotten used to it, and that's not a good thing but used to hearing on the news about thefts and murders and rapes and used to hearing about attacks and destruction and, and, and we hear it every day so we think, well, you know, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of normal. No, it's not normal. It's perilous. This earth is a dangerous place, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, disease. And uh, danger and destruction and evil people. It's a dangerous place. And, and based on this, you and I are not going to be able to believe for the whole earth to become safe. That's right. As time goes on. That's right. Now thank God soon and very soon. Yeah. Jesus is coming back. Yeah. And he's going to fix this thing. <laughs> and then it's going to be safe. Yeah. Everywhere. But till then, sometimes people say you can talk about saving the planet. And there's one side of that, that that's good. But in, the, in the, the complete sense, the planet is not going to be saved. It's dying. 
this planet is dying. The same thing that's happening to your body is happening to this planet that your body came from. Romans says that it is groaning and travailing. It's creaking. It's groaning. That's why you you see the earthquakes and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the tsunamis and the problems with the atmosphere. It's dying because of sin and because of judgment. And how's how's it going to wind up? In the end, the elements, the whole surface of this place is going to melt with fervent heat. It's not going to make it. But then, God's going to redo it. There's going to be new heavens, new earth, and it will be uncontaminated. There will be no curse. Oh, come on, glory to God. I mean no, zero curse. No germs. Nothing will die. Glory to God. No pain. No sorrow. No crying. No dying. Aren't you glad you're saved? And aren't you glad God knows how to fix this thing? He does. But for right now, (laughs) this earth's a dangerous place. We're not going to be able to believe to make it all safe. So what's the issue then? Why, why Why am I teaching? Why are we talking about it? As time goes on, this is not going to become safer. So here's the question. Can God keep you and protect you in a dangerous world? Yes, he can. And the title of our series is called Perfect Protection. Perfect means complete. Perfect protection. Go now, if you would, to Psalm 4. Psalm 4, and verse 8. Psalm 4, 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. I'm going to lay down and not toss and turn, not worry about what's going to happen. I'm going to lay down and what? In peace and sleep. Why? For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Today's English version says, when I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Say that out loud. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe safe. Let's say it together. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. He was making a declaration. You, Lord, are the one who keeps me perfectly safe. Perfect protection. Now you're here in the Psalms. Just turn over a page or two to that familiar and wonderful 91st Psalm, because we've been seeing some things from here. I mean, this is widely regarded as the uh, a protection psalm. Well, we got some good reports from uh, some of our troops. Uh, you know, we've had a team that's been putting together uh, bo- boxes and packages and shipping them, everything from, you know, tissue paper to M&Ms and everything in between, and we got some good reports, and they were blessed and encouraged by it. Phyllis is going to tell you about some of it Sunday, I think, and we'll tell you more about it, but uh, God is protecting our troops, and he's keeping them, and he will protect and keep anybody who will look to him and trust him, but there is a, a Godward side to this, and there is a manward side to this. And we need to know the difference between God's part and our part. Uh, People like to just leave things vague. And millions of Christians think they prefer and like what I call no-fault religion. 
No fault religion, what does that mean? Well, no matter what happens, it's not my fault. And no matter what doesn't happen, it's not my fault. And people like to relegate everything to God. And say, well, if it happened, it's because it was His will. If it didn't happen, it's because it wasn't His will. Well, that's mighty convenient. And it leaves us with absolutely no responsibility. But it simply is not true. I said it's not true. I mean, some of the same people, you try to talk to them about being born again, they don't believe it there. Huh? People say, well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. If it's not, it won't. Well, what if everybody in the world believed that, well, if it's God's will for me to be saved, I'll be saved. I ain't got nothing to do with it. Huh? It's whatever His will is. That's what's going to happen. It is His will that all be saved. It's not His will that any should perish. And yet, have people perished? Are people perishing? Then things are happening that's not the will of God. Right? But it's not God's fault. Man, you, me, we have a will. Right? He said, go into all the world. That's including the islands of the South Pacific. Amen. Right? Yes. And preach the gospel. Amen. Right? Yes, sir. And everybody that will believe and respond will be saved. Yes. But what if they don't? Well, then they won't because it wasn't God's will for them to be saved. No, no, no. Because no. no. they didn't receive it. They didn't do their part. Well, now if that's true about the most important thing in life, why wouldn't it be true about lesser things? Well, it is. And we see that in life, some people are protected and some are not. And a lot of folk like to be vague and say, well, it's just, and and they, they like to say, well, you just never know. You just never know. People quote it like it's a scripture. (laughs) Have you ever read that in your Bible? Anybody know where that's at? It's in first imaginations. (laughs) Wow. You just never know. Men's ideas. (laughs) Now listen. There is a manward side to these things. When we do what he told us to do, when we believe what he told us to believe, can you count on him to do what he said he would do? Yeah. Well, what if we don't believe what he said? What if we, what if we don't believe what he said about protection? What if we don't do what he told us to do to be protected? Can we expect him to protect us anyway? Well, that'd be foolish. That'd be unreasonable. So no, don't blame everything on God. Let's see our part, and let's see that we do it. And then we know we can count on Him to do His part. In Psalm 91, let's read it again. Psalm 91, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, who, who will say? I will. Now see, this is, if you hadn't been with us, this is what our third lesson on this. We were supposed to get in another one last week, but the Lord led us a different direction. But uh, we've already been in on this for two Fridays, I believe it is. And the first one we looked at is, what's our part in this? We are to say this. Hmm? What are we to say? I will say of the Lord what? He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Here's one of the first things that we see here that's our part. We are to believe it. We are to say it. We are to proclaim it. We are to decree it. And if you weren't with us, I'd encourage you, go get the CD, it's free. Download it on the internet, it's free. 
and get caught up with us. But we went into some detail. The Lord told individuals that had rejected him and replaced him with somebody else and something else. Then when they were in trouble and needed to, protect, needed to be protected and helped, he told them, why don't you go to your new God? Let them protect you. Let them help you. This is serious. And we talked about even in our nation. It, it doesn't work. To say, we want God out of our schools, out of our government, out of our courthouses, out of our legislation. No, you got to leave God out. Put it, leave God out. But we want his protection. Doesn't work. I said it doesn't work. And so we can't control everybody. But for you and your family, you need to boldly say, God is my God. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. Amen. He protects me. God is my protector. You need to say it just like you confess he's your savior. You need to confess he's your protector. Say it out loud. God is my God. My protector. He protects me. I serve him. I worship him. I live for him, him. and he protects me. me. You need to believe this. You need to say it. If you're bashful about it or you're whatever, you're unsure, and you sat there and didn't say it just now, well, can you count on his protection? You don't confess him as your God. You don't live for him. You don't believe in him. You're, You're counting on something else. Well, then when it comes down to it, you'll have to rely on that to take care of you. But I'm not that dumb. How about you? No, I know I need help, right? I didn't make myself. I didn't create myself. I don't sustain myself. I'm not the one that made my heart just beat again. Hmm? I believe there is a God, the great almighty creator of heavens and earth. He gives us life and breath and all things. And he is my protector. He's my protector. Now keep reading. It said, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. When you believe in him, trust in him, you say that he's your God and protector, Surely, can you count on it? Surely, he will deliver you. Verse 4 begins to describe how he does it. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. Now, we went into that in the second lesson. We talked about our part. Now, this is his part, right? Let's go over it again. What's our part? We say out loud. Don't let it go weeks and weeks and you don't say it. And especially if anything comes up that tries to scare you or bother you, immediately you ought to start opening your mouth and saying, God is my God. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He protects me. God protects me. Anything tries to scare you or bother you, don't sit there and shake. Stand up and open your mouth and say it out loud. God is my refuge. God is my fortress. He's my deliverer. He's my protector. See, say it out loud. And then if you'll do that, what did he say? Surely. You did your part now. You believe in him. You believe what he said. You trust him. You confess him as your Lord and protector. He said, surely I'm going to deliver you. And he's going to cover you. Now, we saw not just here, but in numerous places in the scripture where the, the picture of either the eagle or the hen protecting her young, right? We saw Jesus uh, long over the city of Jerusalem. And so how often I would have gathered you, gathered you to me like a hen does her chicks. He said, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't come to me. You wouldn't take refuge under my protection. We read in Isaiah about the canopy of protection. Oh, long before Star Trek. 
or lost in space or any science fiction, God had force fields. And you see it in in the uh, deliverance uh, of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. You see how disease would sweep through the land and it would come to the border of Goshen and couldn't go any further. It bounced off of something. Something was around them and protecting them. Glory to God. You know, the devil said about Job, he said, you put a hedge about him and everything he's got. He'd been trying to get to him for years and couldn't. There's a, there's a force field. There's a protection. So in this world, it's dangerous. It's perilous. But that's not the real issue. We're not going to be able to make the whole world a safe place in our lifetime. But the question is, are you covered or are you exposed? Can you be covered? Now, now man, this, this is a rich thing right here. How many remember the Bible says you have an adversary? The devil. He goes about as a roaring lion just chewing up anybody he wants to. Huh? Turn there. Where's it at? Scriptorians? Huh? First Peter? Five? Turn there and look at it real quick. Hold your place in Psalms 91 if you haven't already lost it. If you did, we'll find it again. But uh, First Peter? Five? Eight? Be sober. Be on the watch. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking what? Whom he may devour. Now, there's two two words here that will set you free. Seeking and may. What does seeking mean? He, well, why is he looking for? Why don't he just get you and destroy you? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And it talked about under his feathers, under his wings. We see that language used repeatedly. This canopy of protection covers you where the predator can't find you. He can't see you. He can't find you like the little chick under the mother hen's wing. You ever seen that? Little chicks run up under the mother hen. You can't see them. Where's the chicks? You can't see them. We're seeking to find the little chicks. Where are they? You can't see them. <laughs> Did you get that? Did you see that? Yeah. Unless, of course, you're an independent little chick. <laughs> and you don't need all that. And you're going to, even though Mother Hen clucks and calls, you're going to run out on your own. Well, you're going to be somebody's lunch. But if you're smart... He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The enemy is seeking, and what's that next word? Whom he, there's some he may not. There's some he can't find, and there's some he may not. Because of that protection, can't get to you. Can't, Can't get to you doesn't have access to you. Do you think it's important that we find out how to get in and stay in this place of protection in God? It's very important that we, so we're able to live our full life and and run our whole course because it's short enough as it is without being cut short. So he said that there's this canopy, there's this covering. Back to Psalm 91 if you would, turn back there. This covering, he will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will trust. His truth 
will be your shield and buckler. So now we've seen something that we're supposed to do. And we're seeing something that he said he would do. Let's move further. Well, first of all, say it again. What's, what's your part? What do you do? Yeah. I will say of the Lord. Right? Yeah. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. I trust in him yeah. to protect me, to keep me safe. And then he said, I'm going to deliver you. And I'm going to cover you. Yeah. Yeah. And the enemy will seek you and can't find you. He tried to get to you and can't get to you. The wicked one touches him not. Amen. You believe that? Yes. But now here's something else. Here's our part coming around again. What's the next verse say? What's the next part? Read it out loud. What does it say? You shall not be afraid. Now this is one of the biggest issues. In this whole thing right here. Who controls whether you're afraid or not? Is it true that it's up to you whether you're afraid or not? A lot of people don't believe that. But the answer is yes. It is your, my choice whether we fear or whether we don't. Did the Lord tell us not to be afraid? Only hundreds and hundreds of times. Right? Hundreds and hundreds of times. Did he say, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Hmm? How many times did he tell them in the Old Testament, fear not. Don't be afraid. Now, I think a lot of Christians have thought that was just like a standard angelic greeting. Didn't really expect you to do anything with it. It's just like, hi, how are you? Fear not. What's going on? It's a charge. I said it's a charge. Why does it keep coming up? Why would the Lord tell you, do not fear? Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Why would he tell us that? Again and again. Have you looked this up? Have you studied this? Scores of times, hundreds of times, thousands of times in the scriptures. Why would he tell us this? Because it can remove his legal right to protect you. Fear affects things spiritually in a similar manner to faith. In fact, it's perverted faith. Being afraid of something is having confidence in its ability to hurt you. Just like God can act on your faith and has access to your life through your faith, the enemy, the destroyer, has legal access into your life through fear. Now those of you that were with us, what was it, last year or year before, we, we spent so much time on free from all fears. If you're interested, that's available. It's free. You can get it. But I mean, we stayed on it for weeks and weeks and weeks. Free from all fears. Fear is spiritual contraband to the Christian. You're not supposed to be caught with any. Huh? You're not. You're not supposed to have any fear at all. None. And yet, I've seen on church signs that a little fear is good. I've heard preachers talk about it. Well, they're talking their own theories and ideas. They're not talking the Word. We are commanded not to fear. Is it true or not? Let me give you some scriptures. Now, don't make up your mind till you hear the Word. You should see some of the looks I get sometimes. People are like, well, now, preacher, everybody gets a scared sometimes. It's just human nature. Quit talking human nature and get in the Bible. Quit talking your experience and your theories. 
What somebody else said, get in the Bible. Fear is a big problem. Fear can get you out from under the secret place and the covering. Fear can allow the enemy into your life. Fear can destroy you. What did he say? What did he say? We're talking about God's part and our part. Is this our part right here? You shall not be afraid. Say it out loud. I, I shall, not shall not be afraid. Be afraid. He, he goes with a list. You will not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies in the day, nor for the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor for destruction that wastes at noonday. Uh, what, I mean, that's all from that one phrase, isn't it? What's he saying? You'll not be afraid of terror in the nighttime. You'll not be afraid of the air of flying in the daytime. You'll not be afraid of the pestilence that walks in the darkness. You'll not be afraid of destruction that wastes at noonday. You won't be afraid. Say it out loud, I won't be afraid. I won't be afraid. That didn't say you wouldn't be tempted to fear. This is where people get confused. Well, Brother Keith, I, it just came on me, and next thing I knew, I was afraid. And how can you help that? How can you keep? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> You're in the right place tonight to find out. Yes, sir. Yeah, Amen. it'll set you free. Yes, sir. It is completely up to you whether you fear or not. Yes, just like it's completely up to you whether you believe or not. Yes, Nobody can make you afraid. That's right. Now your head will try to tell you that's not true. Your experiences will try to tell you that's not true. But I'm telling you, the Bible will reveal it to you. Nobody, nothing can make you afraid apart from your will. That's right. You can choose to resist fear. You can have goosebumps double parked. You can have the hair standing up on the back of your neck. Your knees can be bumping together. Your, your heart can be racing. Your blood pressure elevated. You can feel terrified. Yeah. And in the middle of it, from your spirit, you can say, I refuse to fear. I refuse to yield to this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, nothing. I will not fear anything. I refuse to be afraid of anybody or anything ever. Can you do it? Is it possible? Does it make any difference in what kind of life you have? Whether you receive or you don't. Whether you're protected or you're not. Oh, it does. We mentioned Job a bit ago. Go to the book of Job. And you will see from the Bible why all these bad things happen to Job. People say, well, I guess I'm just like poor old Job. Glory to God. Amen. You mean glory to God? Well, Job was a multi-billionaire before the attacks. Historians tell us that probably the whole ordeal of Job happened in less than a year, maybe nine months. He had a bad year. He had a rough year. And then at the end of it, he had to repent about some things. And the Bible said the Lord healed him. So if you're like Job, you got to get healed. You have read it now, haven't you? Huh? The Lord healed him, turned his captivity and healed him and made him whole and gave him twice what he lost. He was a billionaire when he started. Or something just like poor old Job. Poor. People have done so many dumb things with the Bible. 
twisted it around to, to make, you know. They used Job as an excuse for them to live a defeated life right. decade after decade. Yes. That's right. But look what happened to Job. The Bible tells you how the destruction gained access to him in Job chapter 3. If you believe the Bible, Job 3, 25, 325, are you there? What does it say? This is Job talking now, after all these terrible things have happened to him, his children have been killed. His possessions have been robbed and stolen. His body's been attacked with sickness. And what did he say? The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come to me. This is a spiritual law. Fear, like a magnet, draws into your life what you are afraid of. Now, I'm not stepping here. I'm going to give you scripture after scripture that proves this. But out of his own mouth, why did Job say these things happened to him? He said, what I, what I was afraid of, the thing I feared, happened to me. Listen to a, another translation of this. The... Uh, the New Living says, what I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come to be. The English version says, everything I fear and dread comes true. Now go to Proverbs. Let's verify this in the mouth of more than one witness. Proverbs 10. If it's true, that what you are afraid of comes into your life. And it's also true that you control whether you're afraid or not. What should you do? Y'all going to help me with the rest of this tonight or we just going to coast? You want to close right now? No. Huh? No. <laughs> we live in a dangerous place. Right? Dangerous place. Can God keep you and protect you? Yes, sir. Is he able to? Yes. I mean in the midst of uh, bird flu. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. In the midst of terrorist attacks. Yes. Didn't the psalmist go on to say a thousand may fall at this hand. Yeah. Ten thousand may fall over here. Yeah. But it won't happen to me. Can God do that? Yes. Would he do it for you? Yes. Do you have a part in it? Yes. yes, you do. See, most people wouldn't even talk like that, would they? No. I mean, in, in half the churches, you'd walk in if you went in and say, well, I don't care if a thousand people die from a terrorist attack right beside me and 10,000 right on the other side of me, it won't happen to me. Right. People would look at them and go, oh, who do you think you are? You just never know. You just never know. Well, you don't know. That's right. That's right. Then you wouldn't have liked what the psalmist said. That's right. You don't like what the Bible says. You believe something else. Oh, but if you could believe it, if you'd be bold enough, you might as well say it. Somebody might have saw you come in here this evening anyway. They may already think you're one of us, so you might as well get the benefits. <laughs> Some people are not laughing. <laughs> so just go ahead and say it right now. Though a thousand, though a thousand fall at this side, fall at this side though 10,000 10, fall on the other side, on side, it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. Because God protects me. Because God protects me. Amen. And this is not because you're better than somebody else or because you think you're so much more special. No, it's simply because you believe what he told you. Yes, he told you this is the Bible. I didn't yes. write this. You didn't write this. Yes. 
We just choose to believe it. Where some other folk choose to believe, well, you just never know. <laughs> Where are you? Huh? Proverbs 10, 24. I'm proving to you now from the Word, this is not just an isolated phrase. This is a spiritual law. What did Job say? The thing I greatly feared, the thing I was afraid of came on me. What I dreaded came true and happened. 1024, what does it say? The fear of the wicked, what will happen? It will come upon him. But the desire of the righteous shall be granted. What you put on your list, your vision list, it's coming in. Well, you don't want to do what the wicked do. You don't want to fear. You don't want to dread. Let me read other translations. It said the, uh, what the wicked dreads will overtake him. They'll get what they fear most. The fears will all come true. Go to, these are two instances in the New Testament, uh, Old Testament. Go to the New Testament, Hebrews 2. We're establishing in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Is it a spiritual law, a truth that what you fear will come on you? If you know that, then the moment you recognize a fear in your life, man, you ought to jump on it with both feet, right? Because you say, I don't want this happening to me. Hebrews 2, 2 and 15. But let me read 14, it goes with it. 2, 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Hebrews 2, 14, he, Jesus himself, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Did he do it? Yes, he did. And deliver them who through what? Fear. Fear of death were all their lifetime what? Subject to bondage. Does the fear make you subject to the bondage of what you're afraid of? It is a law, spiritual law and truth. More places than this you'll find. Listen to the NIV. He said, and, he said, and to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The New Living says, only in this way could he deliver those who lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now fear after fear comes back to that, the fear of dying. Why are people usually afraid of flying? Huh? They're afraid they're going to fly and crash and die. Why would people be afraid of driving or driving in heavy traffic or getting out on the interstate? Well, they're not just afraid of driving. They're afraid of dying, getting out there, having a wreck, getting killed, getting mushed. They sit in their house and imagine it. Huh? Oh, you could just see that car coming over the median and crashing into me. Oh, and I'm dead. And they come to my funeral. Oh, no, and they bury me. And I'm six feet under and the leaves fall on the grave. And nobody's there. And I'm dead, dead, dead. There are phobias enough to fill endless volumes, fears of cats, fears of seafood, fears, huh? I'm telling you, that, have you ever noticed it? Have you heard it or read it? Fears 
of everything. Hmm? Fears of being around people. Fears of being alone. Fear of, fears of being in tight places. Fear of being in wide open spaces. Fears of being too low and dark. Fears of being too high. And everything in between. It is unchristian to have any kind of phobia. What does Christian mean? One like the Christ. Did Jesus have any phobias? No. Hmm? Can you picture Jesus? <laughs> They're going across the bridge, and he says, Peter, hold my hand. <laughs> this thing is swaying. Can you picture Jesus? Huh? Afraid of anything? No. He says, yeah, but he's Jesus. He didn't do it as God. He did it as a man, showing us how to do it. He's our example, right? And oh, glory to God. When he left here, you know what he said? Huh? Go to John 14. Let's remind you what he said. You know what he said? John 14. Oh, I got a seminar here. I'm trying to preach in one night. (laughs) What else is new, huh? John 14. Glory to God. John 14, verse 1, what did he say? What's the understood subject? You, you let not your heart be troubled. If he, is he saying it's up to you? You can let it be troubled or not. If you really couldn't help it, why would he tell you this? Wouldn't he know it if you couldn't help it? You are not to let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now skip down to verse uh, 27. What did he say? Peace I leave with you. What peace? My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. What did he say? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did he say try? No. Uh-uh. Now, I'm not taking my time on this, but people don't believe this. They just don't. They believe, well, you try, you do the best you can, but sometimes you just, it's just too much. You just... You get scared, man. Fear will come on you and you just, you try not to be afraid. No, Jesus said what? Read it. He said, peace I leave with you. What? Oh man, this this is one. My peace. What is, this is the peace he walked in when he was on the earth. This is the peace he faced disease and devils and crazy people and the cross and death itself with this peace. And he says, now I'm leaving here and I got something I want to give you. This peace that I have walked in the whole time that I've been on earth, I'm giving it to you. So take it. And what? What's the rest of it? And don't let your heart be troubled and don't let yourself be afraid. You just, you just operate in this peace I'm giving you. That's right. Thank you. Can you do it? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. Yes. I came into, I had the privilege of working in healing school at Brother Hagin's ministry for a number of years. And uh, Sometimes you come in there on Monday morning and I mean, it, it just felt like death in the room. The people that are there, a number of them had been given up by medical science. Some of them said they were supposed to have been dead two weeks ago. And sometimes you could just feel the hopelessness and despair and death. If you listen to it, the devil will paint you a picture of you dying. 
all the time of you getting worse and perishing. And, and if you're dumb, you'll listen to it and look at it and meditate upon it. And this is how the Lord led me to start. <laughs> I came in and I, I mean, it just felt like death. And I came in, they're all looking at me. I told God, you got to do something. They say we're going to die. And I closed my Bible. I said, so they say you're going to die. <laughs> Didn't you already know that? <laughs> Let me confirm it for you. <laughs> the Lord tears is coming any length of time. Yeah, you're going to die. And your cat's going to die, and your dog's going to die, and your parrot, and your goldfish, and your favorite flowers, and your trees. And they responded worse than you. You're like, that doesn't encourage me very much, Brother Kit. Before you're ready to live, you've got to be ready to die. And you've got to be able to look death in the face and go, I am not afraid of you. I'm not living my whole life in bondage yes. to different phobias because I'm afraid I'm going to die. Yes. What happens when the child of God dies? Huh? Is heaven a fairy tale or is it real? Are you really a spirit created in the likeness and image of God or are you just a mind and a body? No, friend, when you die, you step out of your body. And it's laying on the bed or it's laying on the ground. And you look at it and you go, wow, that's over. And then you go, I feel good. Ooh, and you look around and there's an angel. He goes, hi. You go, hi. He says, you ready? Yeah. He says, how about, me, how about I take you by the scenic route? You want to see the Milky Way? There's some neat stuff over there. You go, yeah, show me everything. Yeah. And you're out of here. Right. Yeah. Why be afraid of that? Amen. I say, why be afraid of that? And yet, millions of Christians are just, you mention anything about death and they just get quiet and they, all this morbid, oh God, well, what if, oh, what? What if people think it was the great worst thing in the world could happen to you is if you died? No, it's not. Thank you, Lord. Before you're really ready to live, you have to not be afraid to die. You got to be able to look death right in the face. I know uh, my dad, he's in heaven now, but years before he went to heaven, he had this massive heart attack. And he, and, and he believed God and he was coming back. But, I mean, his kidneys were shut down. His all, you know, they thought he should have died. His, his heart looks like it's not even going to stay together through the night. And uh, they wanted him to do some things, some radical things. And I knew my dad, he probably wouldn't do them. And, but he's in the hospital and the doctor came to me. He said, you better talk to your dad. And I said, uh, no, it's up to him. He said, don't you understand me? He could die. I said, he's not afraid to die. Nor am I. The guy looked like you'd slapped him. He looked at me like, I mean, he just, <laughs> I said, he's not afraid to die. Nor am I. See, people, people have this fear of death that just grips them and and, and the devil comes and is able to play with their mind and just scare them and bind them and twist them. and get a, There are people who won't even leave their house. Yeah, people can't eat anything or can't go anywhere or can't do anything. I'm, I might die. You are going to die. Hallelujah. Get ready. <laughs> Say it out loud. I am not, I am not afraid, to die. afraid to die. I'm born again. I'm, born again. I'm a child of God. They're working, on my mansion. They're working on my mansion right now. Right now. Sure, you, you feel it. 
When a loved one or a friend goes home, you feel it in your emotions. But the Bible says we're not to sorrow like those who have no hope. We ought to be able to stand by a graveside and say, Death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Mock it. Mock it. You need to mock your fears. Mock it. Something tries to scare you, say, cancer? What's cancer? I ain't afraid of cancer. Well, I got three people with me. <laughs> Let me go back to this point. Is it true that what you fear can come on you? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Then should you be interested in getting rid of your fears? Yes. If you don't want to have it, you've got to get rid of the fear of it. Right? Yes. Hallelujah. Can you take a little bit more or are you done? Huh? What do you think? I think you need a little more. Where are you right now? Read that aloud again with me out loud. Verse 27. What does it say? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did he tell you that? What should you say? Okay. Hmm? What if Jesus... Right now, right here, what if he came through the ceiling and came right in front of you and looked at you and called your name and said, don't be afraid. Don't let yourself be troubled. Don't. What would you say? I don't know if I can. (laughs) Don't you know he already knows if you can or not? He wouldn't have told you. Unless he already knew you could. And here's the thing. Feelings of fear is not yielding to fear. Thoughts of fear. Feelings of fear. That doesn't mean you're full of fear and nothing can be done. I'm going to go through it again. Hair standing up on the back of your neck. You just heard a report and it hit you like a ton of bricks. You feel bad all these thoughts, all these images, all these feelings are going all over you. Your knees are bumping. You feel afraid. You look afraid. Is this it? You just have to throw up your hands and go, I'm afraid. It's too late. No, now is when it's time for you to say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I refuse to be afraid of this. I mean, say it with your knees knocking. Say it with tears running down your cheeks. You resist. You say, fear, I resist you. I refuse to give in to this. I refuse to yield. And then you begin to say, this, will, this is not how this is going to end. This is not what's going to happen with me. This is not. With long life, he'll satisfy me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh. Show me his salvation. Glory to God. Turn back to the Psalms, please, real quickly. I'm, I'm thinking about closing. Do you have to live in fear? No. Do you have to be afraid? No. no, you do not. Did Jesus command you not to? Yes. Should you keep his commandment? Could, yes. Should you do what he told you? Yes, yes, and you can. Psalm 56. Glory to God. I got way too much information here tonight. <clears throat> Can you come back? Hmm? Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <clears throat> I 
I'm not ready for that one. Deuteronomy 20. Let me give you this and then we'll see. I want you to be ready for tonight or tomorrow. Something tries to scare you and jump on you. You want to be protected and kept. Do you remember when uh, uh, Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, came and and talked about coming, asked Jesus to come and heal his daughter, you know? Remember they're on their way and People from his house came and told him, you know, don't trouble the master any, anymore. She's dead. She's gone. Yes. What do you think happened to Jairus when he heard those words? When he, when he saw them coming, he knows who they are. Why would they be here? This is his little baby. This is his girl. Right? And he knows they wouldn't come and lie about something like that. They look at him and they say, she's, he knew she was near death when he left. They said, she's gone. She's gone. Jesus looked at him and what did he say? What is the first thing he told him? Fear not. not. Only believe. And she'll be made whole. Why would he tell him don't be afraid? Hmm? Would it matter? Would it have mattered if Jairus had yielded to fear or not? Would Jesus have just gone on to his house and raised her up anyway? So this is what people miss. If it didn't matter to the situation, why would Jesus bring it up and be so adamant about it? It was, at that moment, the determining factor in whether she was healed or not. It was hanging in the balance right there. He was tempted. He was feeling shaken. It was going all over him. His emotions were were trying to go berserk. Oh, but can you see those piercing eyes? From the master, when he looks at him, and he called his name, he said, Jairus, right here, right here. Don't be afraid. Can you? In the face of death, can you? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Just keep on believing what you told me a while ago. Stay with me. Stay with me. And she'll be healed. You know what we have recorded that Jairus said then? What do, you, what do you say when you don't know what to say? When you're tempted to say the right thing, you better bite your lip and go. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just follow, follow along behind Jesus. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. Right? And don't talk all that fear that's trying to rage through your mind and your feelings. And say, I will live and not die. Hallelujah. The money will come. Amen. I'm not afraid of what might happen. Glory, where are you? Deuteronomy 20. I want you to see what, how important this is, what an issue this is. In Deuteronomy 20, they are given the instructions for going to war as a nation. Deuteronomy 20 verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and a people more than you, start praying. (laughs) Huh? Uh Uh-uh. He could have said that if he wanted to. What did he say? Hmm? Why is the Lord bringing this up first time like this? Again and again. Because it is the determining factor of whether you're going to let him help you or not. Whether he's going to be able to legally, and he's the one that set it up this way. Be not afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, he's got you this far. He'll get you all the way. Verse 3. And you say to them, well, verse 2, when you come to the battle, the priest will approach and speak to the people. The preacher comes out to the armies all ready to go out to battle. And he said, here, O Israel, you approach the state of battle against your enemies. What did he say? 
Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be terrified because of them. Of all the things he could have said, what did he say? What's the key to winning? What's the key to winning every battle? Don't let yourself fear. He said, for the Lord your God is he that goes with you, so fight to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then he says, the officers speak to the people. They said, anybody got a new house and hadn't dedicated it yet? Then you stay home. Anybody planted a vineyard and hadn't eaten any fruit of it? Then you, you, you stay. Anybody just got married or you're engaged, I should say, and hadn't got married yet? Then you stay. Verse 8, now get this. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house. Yeah. Oh, did you get this? Yeah. They got armies bigger and stronger than they are, ready to take them and defeat them as a nation. And he gets up and says, Now anybody that's scared, go home right now. Don't you think you'd want every able-bodied man out there? Huh? So this hasn't been real enough to us. Is it really that big of an issue that you better off with fewer people and no fear than you are plenty of people in fear? See, sometimes people think, well, if I could just get enough people praying for me. Not if they're praying in fear. You're better off with two people praying in faith than 2,000 praying in fear. Are you afraid? What did he say? <laughs> Go home. Go and return to your house. Read the rest of it. Why? Lest his brother's heart faint as well as his heart. Fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. Yeah. Don't associate with fear. You're trying to stand and believe for something. That's right. That's right. There are times when you're standing and you know it's just not a day that you need to see Aunt Mildred. <laughs> Bless her heart, you love her, but she's a negative soul. And she's going to ask you 39 times, how do you feel? Come on, tell me how you really feel. Oh, baby, it just, I'm so upset. It just bothers me so much that this is going on with you. I just, I just, it just bothers me so much. Light should be going off. Uh, 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 uh. Get your mask on. Get your gloves on, man. We, we, this is contagious. <laughs> Ain't Mildred, I got to go. Bye, bye. I'm serious. I'm, uh, this, it can be the difference between living and dying. Vic, victorious or, or defeated. Coming out or going under. Oh, but what a joy. When you got a faith family. Oh, glory to God. When you got people of faith that you know are only going to talk victory with you. They're only going to talk strength and life and living and receiving and overcoming, that's all they're going to talk. Go to Job in closing. Job. I want you to see a picture that just is etched in my mind, in my heart, of fearlessness. Job 39. Can you, do you have just a minute to, to, to finish this? Don't, don't leave now. You want to get this. What, what do you look like and you sound like when you are absolutely fearless? He, he, here's the picture. Here's the picture. Job 39. Can any good thing come out of Job? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Job 39. 
and 19. God is speaking. And he calls Job's attention to one of his creations. He said, Job, because Job had, Job had run his mouth and said some things that he couldn't back up and didn't understand and had to repent about it. He, actually, he accused God of being unfair is what he did. And he had to repent over that. And verse 19, he said, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you make him afraid as a grasshopper? He said, can you? Can you make him afraid? What's the, what do you think the answer to that is? No. Not this horse. As we read on, you'll see. The glory of his nostrils is terrible. You see him? Come on, y'all with me or not? You see him flaring his nostrils? He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He's got muscles rippling everywhere. <laughs> Testosterone off the charts. <laughs> He's pawing. His nostrils flaring. He goes on to meet the armed men. Verse 22, he mocks at fear. And is not affrighted, neither turns he back from the sword. He's talking about a war horse. Something we may not know much about nowadays. We may not have seen them. I mean, you've seen them in different horses that are, uh, you know, their, their strength. But I mean, in this day and age, horses were trained from a colt. And they were trained, and these, these horses grew to love it. They loved it. And notice what it says. Uh, the quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He loves it. He, hear, he hears that, that, that spear and that shield and it just makes his nostrils flare and he swallows the ground with fierceness and rage. And he neither believes he that the sound of the trumpet, I mean when they, when they sound for retreat, he don't like it. He don't believe it. He's like, what's wrong with y'all? Run and fight. He loves it. He says among the trumpets, ha, aha, he smells the battle afar and the thunder of the captains and the shouting. A war horse will run right into a spear, run right into it and just pierce them all the way through, flaring nostrils and pawing. That's the way to die. Don't quit me now. Don't. Quit me now. Don't, don't be a part of this little milk toast generation. Little scared we're going to die. Come on, come on. God has called us to be warriors, unafraid of anything. Glory to God. Don't be afraid of dying. No, sir. If you're going to be concerned about anything, be concerned about dying scared yeah. and hiding and doing nothing. Yeah. I mean, you're going to die? Die. Yeah. Go out with a blast, yeah. with a blade. Yeah. I mean, unafraid of anything. Yeah. Oh, come on, come on. Do you see this? Yes, sir. Why would God bring this up? Why does he tell He, he wants to tell Job, because Job's been whining and carrying on. I wish I was never bored. I was never bored to see these kind of bad things. He said, let me tell you about something I made. Let me, have you ever seen one? Let me tell you about something I made. Why would he make him? He likes this. I said, he likes this. You see something of God in this. The NIV in verse 22 said, he laughs at fear. He laughs at it. Afraid of nothing. He does not shy away from the sword. He smells the battle afar off. He wonders, where's my rider? Where's my rider? Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
oh, come on, let's get him, let's get him, let's get him. And he will run his heart out, and he will charge. He don't care if he dies. He'll run right into a sword. He'll run right into a friend. Dying for the child of God is nothing to be afraid of. But I'm telling you, living and cowering in fear and hiding from everything and afraid of everything, that's the tragedy when you call yourself a child of God. Come on, stand on your feet. I want to see you paw a little bit. (laughs) Stand on your feet. I want to I want to hear you snort a little bit. I I want to see a little pawing. Huh? Can you help me out? Let me read this to you again. Have you given the horse his strength? You clothed his neck with thunder. Can you make him afraid? What's the answer? cannot make him afraid the glory of his nostrils is terrible I want you to show the devil your nostrils (laughs) what are you showing him what are you showing him you are not afraid at all he paws in the valley and rejoices in his street come on I want you to paw a little bit ah Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Oh, glory to God. I ain't afraid. (laughs) He mocks at fear. He mocks it. Later on it said, he says, aha, aha, ha ha. Earlier in Job, it said, at destruction and at famine, thou shalt laugh. Well, you don't do that if you're scared. You laugh at it. Well, people will think you're weird. They'll think you've lost it. But you'll still be going when they're gone. And you'll win again and again. You'll overcome again and again. And God will be able to protect you and keep you. And make you strong and make you an overcomer. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, greater is He that is in me. Greater is He that is so glad I know I know I know oh than he that is in everybody sing and say say greater greater the greater ones living inside greater I'm so glad I know greater is he that is than he that is in the world. Said out loud, the Lord is my God, my refuge, my fortress, my protector. He will deliver me. He covers me and protects me. So I will not be afraid of the terror at night. I will not be afraid of the arrow in the daytime. I will not be afraid of pestilence or destruction or anything because God protects me. Oh, sing it again. So glad I know that greater, greater
Hallelujah. Brother Dave, would you come on up? What about that offering? What was it? Are we getting a boat? Yes. Yeah, we're getting a boat. Glory to God. The offering tonight was almost uh, $50,000. Hallelujah. Now that counts mine and Phyllis's. So that puts us at 350. From 500, we're down to 350. And it's fading fast. Now we're going to receive another offering Sunday morning. How many believe this is coming in quickly now? We're in faith. It's coming in quickly. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Come on, Brother Dave. Close this out. Hallelujah. Thank you. Let's just keep thanking him. Thank you, Father. Thank you that it is coming. Thank you for your protection. Thank you that we don't have to be afraid. Praise you. You know, these aren't just theories. This is truth. When this word gets in your heart, you walk out of here and you don't look at anything in fear anymore. You just walk and, and live it. Praise God. We don't have to be afraid anymore. You know, you may be here tonight. You may just say, you know, I like the sound of this. I want to get in. How do I get in? We can help you out. We can help you out. As people are leaving today, we're going to sing. And as people are being dismissed, they're going to be walking out. If you, if you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never made that commitment in your life, there's going to be people standing in the front here tonight ready to talk to you. So don't walk out the door. Come down here and talk to him. Or say you've walked away. Say you haven't been living for God. You haven't been doing the right things. But you know he loves you. You know he wants you back. Don't walk out that door without, without coming down here tonight and letting people know. Let, them, let us pray with you. Let us uh, answer any questions you might have. Amen? Amen. They're going to sing. Let's, let's, let's sing this as we're dismissed. Hallelujah.